Hello, and this is Mike. I'm one of the hosts of the Abundant Aging Podcast. And this is Beth. I'm the other host for the podcast. And I think this is the first time, Mike, that you and I have appeared together on the podcast. But it's certainly not the last time, Beth. And we're looking forward to some upcoming shows where you and I can really unpack kind of the foundational tropes of ageism. And uh, I think hopefully use that as a great foundation leading into our symposium in October, right? Absolutely. It'll be October 4th, 2024 this year. And uh, more information and teasing about that um, in the upcoming weeks. In the meantime, we're taking a little bit of a summer um, break here. And I'm going to invite you to revisit some of the um, fantastic conversations that we've had over the course of the past year or so. That's right. So uh, absolutely make sure to stay tuned and listen to more of great content that you've already enjoyed. And please send us your ideas for future guests, future episodes, whatever you need to share or whatever you'd like to share at AbundantAgingPodcast.com. Looking forward to um, hearing from you and to providing new episodes coming a little bit later this summer. Thanks all for participating and, and listening and, and um, being with us here on the Abundant Aging Podcast. Thanks for listening all. We'll look forward to seeing you guys back in the fall. You're talking about the new map of life, but the current map of life is I'm a baby, I'm a toddler, I'm a child, I'm an adolescent, I am adult, I'm middle-aged. You know, do you see a future where we'll just be adolescents for longer or we'll be middle-aged for longer? I mean, is that, is, yeah. what, what do you think about that? Yeah, there's a, 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 a lot of thinking we need to do about where to put the 30 extra years we were handed. Uh, so far, we tacked them all on at the end and only old age got longer. Um, I've been asking people for years, if you could make any stage in life longer or you could put added years anywhere you wanted, where would you put them? And no one has ever said I would make old age longer, but that's what we have done so far. So we have used these years in the least imaginative way possible. And it's a, a, a way that puts a lot of strain on uh, societal institutions and uh, families and individuals to prepare for these really long stretches of life. But I like the idea of moving away from stages and using added years so that we have more flexibility. Uh, the model that you just described, which clearly is the prevailing model of human development as we go through stages. And the the idea of stages, though, is that you never go backwards. You're, 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 you're not a child and then you become a toddler again. You're not middle-aged and then you become a young adult. But I think we might want to rethink that so that we use these longer lives to be able to have more flexibility and what we do when. So, so today you're not, you're not expected to be a student uh, when you're 60. Why not? <laughs> you know? right. So um, we could begin to think of those things. An explorer, we think of that as uh, a youthful kind of an exercise. Uh, go trek around the world and uh, see new things and explore places that you should do in your 20s. Well, why? Yeah. Uh, maybe, but maybe you want to do that in your 60s and, and, and do a little of it in your 20s and a little of it later. So I, I would like us, instead of thinking of a way to, to come up with a, a new script uh, that's relatively rigid, to instead say, what are the different routes we could take with this new map of life? And that's it. So, and, and I'm a terrible interviewer because I should have just, just <laughs> asked you at the beginning to explain what this new map of life is. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> when we founded the Center on Longevity in 2007, we founded it based on three different divisions. One we called mind, which included uh, cognition, but also a sense of emotion, a well being, and, and purpose. One is mobility but that was really functional health. And the other is financial security. And we thought these are three legs of a stool. And if we could sure them all up, we'd be good to go. You know, people will do well in old age. I still think there's a lot of truth to that. But what we found in the first, um, you know, decade of our work was that every time we went to work on a project within one of those areas, it drew on the others. Um, you have a really hard time gaining and sustaining financial security if you're in poor health 
or if you're cognitively impaired. And if you're cognitively impaired, um, you're more likely to suffer physically in other ways. So they, they weren't cleanly divided. And, and the reason we had done that early on is we were encouraged by our friends and colleagues uh, around the world and at the university to focus. I mean, I, I, I hear the voices still in my head saying, Laura, you have to focus. You know, you can't do everything. You got to say, and we're just going to do A, B, and C, and you can't do it all. And I really took that to heart and I believed it and followed it for a long time. And one morning I woke up and I thought to myself, we need to boil the ocean. With apologies to the climate scientists, we do need to do it all. And it's because it's all connected. Um, and it's not just as individuals connected, it's also societal structures, again, social norms that tell us when we're going to do things and not do things. We need, we need to really rethink how we live our lives. And we can't just say we're going to do it different financially. We can't just say we're going to do it differently in terms of our careers unless we think about other parts of that, like family uh, and um, education, uh, environmental supports for, for us. So we have to think about all of it. And it was that realization that really pushed us toward the new map of life. The other thing, the, the last, the, 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 the last sort of experience that I had and my colleagues had that really made us reconsider broadly what we were doing is we had done a survey in conjunction with Time magazine. And one of the questions we asked people was, what are your goals and dreams for living to 100? Top two responses were, I hope I don't have dementia, and I hope I haven't run out of money. And I looked at those findings and thought, we need to raise that bar. <laughs> right. Of course we need to do those things, but that shouldn't be the top of the list of our dreams. You know, we are going to go at that. We have to do that. Yes. But if we only if we only have this kind of white knuckled approach, I hope I don't have this. I hope I don't, that doesn't happen to me. Again, we miss the opportunity that's right in front of us to do better, uh, to do bigger things. And so we had a meeting in 2018, about half of the people we invited were academics from every discipline you can imagine, from economics to medicine, psychology, sociology, on and on. And about the other half were from outside academics, uh, people uh, from industries like automotive industries, financial services, uh, but also philanthropy, uh, small businesses, uh, people in education, public schools. And we brought them together and we said, we want you to do two things. One is imagine a thriving century long life. And the second thing is to begin to say, how would we get the majority of people there? Uh, first of all, we know we can have thriving 100-year lives because, as you have noticed also, a lot of people are already doing that. The question is, how do we build a world so most people reach 100 doing well? Uh, that's, that's the challenge. And so then we started to come up with all these different ways we would need to live life, and we began to think of it as a map. Um, where would we do, where would we make changes? Uh, uh, how would we live our lives differently if we were starting from scratch and saying, I want you to map out 100 years versus I want you to map out 50? Because that map of 50 is the map that's still guiding us today, even though we may live to be 100. So that was the idea. And we left this meeting and I was walking down the stairs from the building where we'd had the meeting and commenting to a friend that it was the most interesting meeting I'd ever been at. And we quickly agreed that if all we did for two days was to provide a nice experience for a bunch of relatively privileged people, this was a failure. And so we somehow... <laughs> raised enough money. This was, this was some, a gift somehow from heaven. We, we raised enough money to appoint nine postdoctoral fellows the following year. And they came from nine areas that were identified in this meeting as parts of life that would need to change. 
And each one of them did a deep dive report on that domain from work, education, environmental exposures, things like this. And then we integrated those reports across these very different disciplines and came up with a number of insights that were common sort of across their different um, uh, uh, analyses. And when we put them together, we call, began to call it and describe the story of this effort as the new map of life. We are now appointing our third cohort of postdoctoral fellows, and they have been amazing wonderful and we're really making headway and finding some solutions for uh, living long lives. I think that's wonderful because you know it strikes me that you know you are what you're boiling the ocean I, I understand but the thing is you're starting from a point of certainty you know God God forbid you know something happens to the world mm -hmm. but I mean one of the most predictive things I think outside of climate change I think the most predictive thing is the age wave. Yeah. Just this 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 place yeah. that we founded ourselves through yeah. that, that we know for certainty that there will be X number of people moving into 90s and hundreds and that we know that a good proportion of them are just doing their thing, you know, and 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 so we know it's there. But at the same time, and I, I'm going to sort of quote uh, Bob Kramer, who we've had on the show before, mm -hmm. and Bob's terrific. He said, you know, you, you've got people who essentially have no example about pe of, of, of people living this way. I mean, everybody, mm -hmm. people in their 90s and 100s, he said, are genuinely surprised that they have lived as long as they have. Right. And they've sort of taken anything that they can get just because, you know, they're grateful for it, you know, for whatever upbringing. Yeah. And, 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 and so it just seems that there's just not enough example of people, of normalcy mm -hmm. into the 90s and 100s, right? So we have to like really celebrate and highlight just those normal stories, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I tell people they're the pioneers, um, uh, but they they didn't sign up for it. <clears throat> people who are in their <laughs> 90s today didn't have any real reason to think that they were going to make it to 90 because their ancestors didn't make it to 90. Um, and so it, it a lot of people came to old age by surprise. Um, they're surprised they're still around. Uh, but current generations don't can't get away with that surprise anymore. We have some good confidence of what the population will look like in the future, just as you just described. And so we need to begin to plan. Um, there's an economist, Andrew Scott, a good friend of mine. He's a wonderful thinker. And he just published a, a, a book about aging and longevity. And he, one of the things he says is it, it, it's, it's kind of like listening to the weather report. If you hear that there's a 4% chance of rain, you don't necessarily take an umbrella or your raincoat. You hear it's 20% and you kind of go, well, you know, maybe I'll I'll hook it over the back of my chair. Maybe I'll remember it. Maybe not. When they tell you there's an 80% chance of rain, you bring your raincoat and your umbrella. That's where we are today with longevity. True, it might not happen. It might not rain, but we need to be prepared for much longer lives. Yeah, very well said. And you know what? What occurs to me is that you know with. The, the the asset that you build, you may you, your body may start to disappoint yourself. It's mm -hmm. yourself. You may have limitations. You may you may you know sit around with your friends all day and talk about your medical problems because guess what? They're important, and you want to you know yeah. you want that emotional support. But it seems to me that we build this very valuable asset in terms of lived experience. And in, all, in many non-Western societies, that's recognized and valued as being an elder, and it doesn't seem to be present in Western society. And here we are, by the way, that we are we are recording this in June of 2024, and we it's an election year. And I'm just wondering, just to, just just in your research, have you found really the, the the benefits of this experience, like how it how it may complement, evolve, and just really be an asset to society? And, I, and I'll mention this, you know, I, I, you know uh, I'm going to sound self-important because I read The Economist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great journal. <laughs> yeah, but, there's, but there's, there was an article just about this subject and they were talking about the political leadership, you know, and, and, and if, you know, if you look at history into, I don't know, like the Spartans or the Romans and mm -hmm. all the, 
you know, we hear a lot about the wars because that's what they happen. But it's like, hey, look at all the wars that happened back then, and look at who was leading those mm -hmm. those societies. They were they were men, mm -hmm. predominantly in their thirties and forties. Mm -hmm. It may not have had calm heads. That may have not have built that resilience up. Do you see? What do you see in terms of lived experience as that asset? Mm -hmm. Uh. Emotional development is one of the most positive aspects of aging. Uh, with age, people are slower to anger, uh, more likely to feel grateful, uh, more likely to have deep, rich emotional experiences where you're smiling, but you also have a tear in the eye because you know this won't go on forever. Uh, there is a richness to emotional life uh, in advanced years that we don't see in, in, at younger ages. And I think that's because so much of it has to do with perspective. It, you can't have the perspective of how things have changed over many decades when you haven't been alive many decades. It's just, you know, it, 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 it's impossible. And I don't mean to diminish anything about the emotional lives of younger people, but that per, that that quality of, of understanding in a deep emotional way that time passes, life doesn't go on forever, things come and go. That's something that to be able to really feel that is something that generally takes decades to, to, to come about. And older people have that. So I believe that when we're thinking about leaders of countries, that having that quality is a great asset. It is not the only important asset. Uh, I don't know how anybody keeps up the physical pace that our leaders do, presidents, uh, traveling, you know, all over the world. Every week they're somewhere else. I don't know about you, boy, when I go and travel and I'm in, you know, a 10 hour time zone difference, I don't you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling great every minute and they're doing it all the time. I don't know how they do it. So there's a physicality to it. Certainly younger people have that advantage over older people, the physical strength and, and, and um, uh, uh, vitality. Uh, cognitively, we don't see nearly as much change with age as people believe it's there. And I think that's largely because of something you and I were talking about a few minutes ago, and that's Alzheimer's disease. We don't know how to diagnose Alzheimer's disease before symptoms appear, but we know the disease starts long decades, years before symptoms appear. And so in the research on cognitive aging, where the older our samples are, the more people are going to be in it who are in those early stages of dementia. What that results in is an exaggeration of the kind of cognitive problems that people may face as they age. You're going to have very significant cognitive problems if you have dementia. You're going to have relatively mild cognitive impairment or slowing if you have a healthy brain, and most of us do. This is a, a long-winded way of saying, I think we're exaggerating cognitive decline, but we do see some changes in cognition, like the speed of processing new information, uh, retrieving words, especially names. Um, I wouldn't remember my name if I didn't see it on a screen <laughs> half the time. You know, it's like, but but the words come to us. They just come later. It's not that we forgot them in some way. It's the retrieval is slower. So that's the cognitive change. And then you have emotional assets. The emotional changes are improvements and emotional stability, emotional balance. So you put those things together, physicality, cognition, and the ability to make wise decisions based largely on experience and perspective and emotion. Uh, and what we need to do is to evaluate people individually across all of those uh, areas when we want to elect leaders. It's troublesome for us to say, or tr troublesome to me, when I hear people say we should have an age limit on leadership because there will be people 
and their 70s and 80s who should not be serving high pressure, cognitively demanding uh, jobs. But there'll be a lot of them who are as well suited or better suited than anybody else available for the position. So we see tremendous variability or heterogeneity in aging. And the idea that age is going to be the determinative factor is just not supported by data, by evidence. Uh, We need to consider individuals uh, when we think about different kinds of leadership positions.